Empathy is a major concept in the design world, and increasingly so, maybe to the point that it's starting to reach buzzword status. I think this is the case across all fields of design, but in this video I'm going to focus specifically on UX design or human-computer interaction, and I want to talk a little bit about the history of how that came to be and where that seed was planted. I'm going to focus on this paper, Empathy and Experience in HCI, which was published in 2008 at the CHI conference. This is the number one conference in human-computer interaction, or HCI, uh, annual conference sponsored by the ACM. So in this, in this paper, Wright and McCarthy, they basically make the point that HCI as a field has always wanted to, quote unquote, know the user, right? Historically, this meant things like understanding human physiology and motor capabilities in order to design the most usable input devices, like a mouse and a keyboard. Um, they moved on from that to exploring things like human memory and learning, and all along the way the emphasis was on things that can be quantified or measured numerically. From the 1990s onward, there was a little bit of a shift, maybe a move towards a bigger understanding of what know the user could mean. As Wright and McCarthy say, there, there was a movement towards integrating an idea of knowing the user to understand the full range of human experience and not just stuff that can be easily quantified. So in this paper, Wright and McCarthy argue that the key word for unlocking this full range of human experience is empathy. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this word is used a lot nowadays, but that wasn't the case back in 2008. The first thing that we should note about empathy is that it's not the same thing as sympathy. With empathy, in design or anywhere, the goal is not to feel somebody else's pain, for example, as if it was your own, but rather it's trying to understand what the pain is like for that person, what does that pain mean, how does it affect their life, how do they move forward with that pain. Wright and McCarthy also point out that there's a kind of intersubjectivity, is the word that they use, um, with empathy. It's not just a one-way street. So that is, uh, you're not just like taking in information from the person in a, in a one way, right? The designer is putting themselves in a kind of two-way relationship with whatever person that they're empathizing with, trying to think about how the two of them fit within a larger context. So it's not just that you're looking at the user as an isolated person, you as the designer, but rather that you're trying to see the world through their eyes while also seeing the world through the designer's lens. So sort of, there's sort of a double interpretation going on. Those are the basics of empathy, and that might be a great vision, like you might agree with that off the bat, but you might be wondering, okay, great, how do you achieve it? What do you do next? In the bulk of this paper, after these sort of introductory remarks, Wright and McCarthy outline a number of different methodological approaches to doing empathy cultivating empathy, doing empathizing type research, all right? And I think, you know, if it's interesting to read this paper over a decade, you know, a decade and a half nearly down the line, because a lot of the stuff that they talk about has been adapted and adopted in the world of design thinking under that label specifically. Firms such as IDEO and the Stanford Design School, they explicitly put empathizing as a stage early in the design process. So it's interesting to look at this list of methodologies that Wright and McCarthy outlined back in 2008. They broadly have two categories. The first category is with people, and the second category is without people. All right, and just as a sort of side note, this is somewhat analogous to when we look at evaluation within HCI and UX. As you may know, you can evaluate a system or a prototype with users or without users. Uh, with users, for example, being usability testing, without users, for example, being heuristic evaluation. In this case, we're talking early, early on in the design process at this empathizing or discovery or early research stage. And it's interesting that here too, we can also do these activities with users or without users. So this paper is sort of a, a menu or a recipe book of different ideas for doing empathizing research. With users, this is all about dialogue, about a back and forth um, with people. A lot of these methods are inspired by ethnography, and another category of these methods is uh, using probes. So designed objects that you give to people or have people react to, see what they do with them. Uh, these aren't 
objects in the sense of a designed product, but rather something that's provocative or stimulating or, or whatever that may be, something to spark a conversation and learn more. In the bucket of without users, which is maybe more interesting and a little more off the beaten path, you know, with, without users, what can you do? These methods are all around narrative and imagination. So some of the examples that Wright and McCarthy talk about are reading fiction, watching movies, writing out design scenarios, um, sort of in the flavor of science fiction or design fiction. Importantly, these kind of scenarios have the capacity to reflect not just the outer life of the characters or the users or personas in the scenario, but also their inner life. You know, again, getting back at that, the full range of human experience. Other methods, role-playing is a big one that they talk about. And another interesting one is sort of uh, autobiography, self-exploration, thinking about your own experiences with technology as a sort of lens on what possible experiences are out there for people in the world. In this paper, Wright and McCarthy forecast and caution that HCI as a field needs to develop rigorous and tested and useful methods for doing empathizing research. And I think looking at this paper from the future, I think that's really come true. The methods they discuss are still central, even if we probably haven't tapped the full capacity of a lot of these. For example, probes are not super common and autobiographical methods also not super common, especially in industry settings. So maybe we can learn a lesson from this old paper and see, okay, there's some interesting applications still to be had here. It's also interesting to see that other methods that Wright and McCarthy didn't imagine have been devised since their writing. I think maybe the most common way of doing empathizing nowadays is through interviewing. Um, maybe this is you know akin to these ethnographic methods, but super, super, super light form of eth ethnography, just simple interviews. Uh, other methods of doing this kind of research, participant observation, diary studies have been developed and are very popular and there's a lot of good guidelines on having people use journaling with text imagery or videos along the way to collect their experiences. There are techniques around drawing and graphing, um, for example, in, in user journey mapping. These are all really rich techniques and another plus of them is that they tend to be really fun to use and learn about people through using them. So if you're just getting started working on this stuff, there's a whole trove. So any of the terms I just mentioned, you can, uh, you know, the ones that weren't in the paper, you can just Google them and, and find all kinds of advice and best practices and tips and so on. Undoubtedly, new methods are going to continue to be developed. And, you know, this raises questions of how do you decide which method is best for your project? Well, I think just keep in mind the end goal, which has been the end goal since the beginning, know the user, right? Know the user across a range of experiences. And I think if you approach the project with that lens, your methods will sort of follow after that.